We'd like to welcome you to Northside Christian Church today on our last service here at 117 East Jefferson. And the, the team in, inspired me to find something from the different decades that we have been here. So as we sing through, I'll let you know what year the songs were published in. And um, we will have a great time singing through the decades as we head out of this building today. Would you stand and join? We're going to begin with This Is The Day from 1967. One, two, three, four. that uh, it will be pleasing for you and for the Lord for many years to come. And I offer you my congratulations. The first one that I remember is 
J.C. Wilhoyt, who was a sergeant in the Kentucky State Police. We had a youth rally, and I believe we were at a skating party in Lexington. And J.C. came up to me and he said, George, are you still interested in starting a church? And I said, yes, I am. He said, go see my brother. And so on Sunday afternoon, I went to see Roger Wilhoyt. I knocked on the door, he came to the door, and I said, are you interested in starting a New Testament Christian church in Georgetown? He said, come on in. For the next few months, we met in his basement, just three or four people. But we put together the idea of planning the church. Anyway, it came time to fix a date to start. So we fixed that date. And the enthusiasm that followed, I cannot explain. God bless you as you began services on the hillside property. May you always be faithful and true to the word because it is our authority. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Good morning. I want to welcome you today to Northside Christian Church. My name is Nick Skinner. I'm the senior minister here, and it is so wonderful to see those of you who are here in person with us today, as well as we know a number of you that are online today. We're so glad you're joining us today on this very special day, and we are looking forward to being able to continue celebrating in the Lord uh, here this morning. All the 62 years that Northside has been located in this part of downtown, and we have been so thankful for so much over those 62 years. As a matter of fact, I want to kind of help us kind of look back a little bit here today. I want to start uh, by just simply asking people this question. And if you're online today, I want you to participate in the chat as well. You can share your response to this question or these questions uh, here uh, just in the chat there. We want to encourage you to participate with us. But I want to ask some questions. First of all, I want you to raise your hand if you were married at this location. If you married your spouse here at this location, raise your hand. All right. If you were baptized here, you can put your hands down. If you were baptized, if you were immersed here at Broadway and Jefferson, raise your hand. Praise the Lord for that. That's awesome. All right. Now I want you to put your hands down. Here's the next question I want you, and I'm going to have you stand as we do this, okay? So we're going to go through, and I want to know when you started attending Northside. Now, some of you may even say, hey, I just started attending today. That's cool. We'll get to you, too. <laughs> if you were here and you started attending Northside, maybe you were that first service or that first year, 1959, would you stand if you were attending Northside in 1959? Awesome. <laughs> If you started attending Northside in the 1960s, you guys can stay standing. If you started attending Northside in the 1960s, if 1960s, that was the decade you started attending. All right, Maxine, Betty. All right, Joanne's waving <laughs> back there. Awesome, awesome. The 1970s, stay standing, everybody. 1970s. If you started attending Northside in the 1970s, awesome. The 1980s, if you started attending Northside in the 1980s, all right. The 1990s. The 1990s. There we go. All right. The early 2000s, 2000 to 2010. Stand up. All right. There we go. And of course, 2010 to the present day. If you started attending Northside, and that, there we go. It should be, if you're today, this is your first time at Northside, stand up. We're glad you're here too. This is great. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's stay standing. We're going, to have a, we're going to have a word of prayer, a blessing upon our service, and then we'll continue in worship today. Father, we thank you today for your faithfulness, Lord, and your faithfulness has long gone beyond 62 years. 
but since the beginning of time. And Father, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to us and to this church. And uh, Lord, the fellowship of believers and then the influence in this community. Lord, we pray your blessing uh, as we continue through this time together, that it would be a time of great remembrance, that it would be a time of great encouragement, and that, Lord, it would be a time of, of course, remembering most importantly your son Jesus Christ, for whom this is all about, because of what he did at the cross and the empty grave that stands still empty to this day. Father, we love you. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings to you, you the family of Northside Christian. What a glorious day the Lord has enabled you to share today where he's brought you. Now, my name is Jim Hutchison, and I'm here to rejoice with you. And uh, many of you will not recognize this old face unless you've been around a long time too. But it was in the late 1970s that uh, we served the Lord together. And he taught us so much through the unexpected death of my wife. Those were difficult days. But he came alongside me and, and strengthened my spirit with his. And he came alongside me through you, the church, with your encouragement and love and support. And um, it enabled us all, taught us how to be uh, strength and help to many others who are suffering. And so uh, those, though the events were difficult, those were good years. There have been several builders once the foundation was laid, but now the Lord is ready to lead you to a new chapter, and I, along with the other ministers, wish you the very best. Congratulations. God bless you, and grace and peace be yours from evermore. <laughs>
Good morning. Another thing that's changed since 1959. Microphones. I'm going to read from Galatians 6 this morning, verses 6 through 10. Never lo- nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. I'm going to read a letter in lieu of a video from Tommy Simpson, former pastor here at Northside, letter to the church. Dear brothers and sisters of Northside Christian Church, Zella and I are very excited about your relocation to the west side of Georgetown. We are very thankful to our Lord for allowing us to be a small part of the journey along the way to the vision he has for you. We remember well the crowded parking lot and people parking along Jefferson Street and Broadway. Because of the crowded parking conditions, many of us would park in city parking and hike up the incline to the church house. We also remember the construction of the auditorium right after we arrived. Such a beautiful place to worship. I've always been grateful that Northside would take a young man like me to preach, as I had not had experience in the preaching ministry. I had been serving as an associate that preached once a month. So when Northside called me there to preach, I was very grateful to our Lord and to the church there to provide the opportunity for me to learn and grow in the preaching ministry. So many memories there at Northside. I will share one memory of a baptism that I will never forget. I did not know the fellow was afraid of water until after his baptism. All went well until I placed him under the water. While under the water, he broke free with his right hand and came up very quickly, throwing water all over the choir loft. Fortunately, the choir had left beforehand. His baptism was very providential because sometime later, he was killed. So I also remember conducting his funeral. And when I conducted his funeral, I was so thankful to the Lord that he had been baptized into Christ. Zella and I remember well and cherish the most precious people who loved and gave and worked and served in the kingdom of our Lord at Northside. While several of these people remain greatly involved in the kingdom work, many people have transferred to glory to be with our Lord. Zella and I are also very excited that you have Nick and Elizabeth Skinner. I served alongside Nick for several years. He and Elizabeth have hearts for people. They will lead you well. Buildings come and buildings go. Relocation projects come and relocation projects go. But the kingdom of our Lord, his church, will remain until his second coming. Be grateful for the memories of the past. Keep moving forward. Fulfill our Lord's vision for his church. God's eternal best, Tommy and Zella Simpson. From the year 2006. Amazing grace, my chains are gone.
will soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be morning. Why do we celebrate communion the way that we do? That question was on my mind this week when I was preparing for my meditation. My son Grant started going to Catholic school last year, and part of their education involves religious studies. Since he goes to Northside and he's taught by Miss Rhonda, he knows the Bible, and he's prepared uh, in those classes, and he knows as much about the Bible as a a lot of those kids there at St. John. But he has a lot of questions about how we do things versus the traditions in the Catholic Church. And it's, it's not acceptable for me to say, well, look, you know, we're right, they're wrong, just get over it, accept it. Um, so I've had, kind of had to up my game, and so we're learning together what those differences are. So I read about the Cane Ridge Revival this week where the Restoration Movement began. So it's not far from here. Uh, Barton Stone was a Presbyterian minister at the Cane Ridge Presbyterian Church and decided to hold an annual communion service. And this is on the frontier, so people don't have a chance to, to celebrate communion. So as many as 20,000 people showed up for that communion service. So he had to, uh, and, and not just Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, unchurched people uh, came to receive the sacraments. So Stone had to have other ministers assist him because there were so many people. Some of the Presbyterian leaders disagreed with these ministers giving communion to people outside of the Presbyterian church. And so eventually Stone left the Presbyterian church and formed a new movement of which we're part today. The early restoration movement tried to get away from creeds, confessions of faith, and rituals and return to the practices of the early church from the Bible in the book of Acts. One of the slogans I've heard from the Restoration Movement is, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no law but love, no name but the divine. Another is, do Bible things in Bible ways. Looking at how the early church did things from the Gospels, Acts, and the Epistles guides us in what we do. And this is true for communion also. So what does this mean for communion? First, we take communion once a week. Uh, in Acts 20, Luke talks about breaking bread with believers in Troas on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. There are several other examples in Acts showing that communion was a central part of early believers worshiping on a weekly basis. Second, any believer can take communion in our church. We say that we are Christians only, but not the only Christians. We welcome all believers. Third, when we take communion, we're remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Fourth, communion is a time to ask for forgiveness. Jesus said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Some churches only celebrate communion quarterly or even once a year. In other churches, you know, communion is as much about ritual as it is about the things that I just talked about. I thank God that I'm in a church that celebrates communion weekly and that welcomes anybody who's a Christian believer to take the emblem. Let's pray. God, thank you for bringing us all together here today, the body of Christ. And Lord, we ask that we remember your sacrifice when we take these emblems. In your name we pray. Amen.
morning and congratulations Northside for your faithfulness in following God to this special moment. A vision almost 20 years in the making is about to become sight. I'm sure I share with most of you, though, some bittersweet thoughts about this last day on Jefferson Street. Preparing opened a floodgate of memories for me. Sunday is where the Spirit of God tangibly moved here. Baptisms and rededications of life. The deep spiritual silence here during 24-hour prayer vigils toward this day. Emotional moments like the funeral for our dear Miss Red. The excitement of children's musicals. The powerful adult choir cantatas for Christmas and Easter. The time I parked a motorcycle on the platform for a month. Still not entirely sure about that one. The point here is that the vital core of these and so many other moments it is not that they took place in this room. It's that they happen because of the presence of God and you. Whether here or on the hillside, the heart of Northside Christian Church has been and will continue to be the love of its people for Christ and others. In this, it has never been more true that wherever the people of Northside are gathered, the Lord will be in your midst. It was an incredible privilege to join with you for a few of the steps that led to this new day. I am so thankful to have been part of God's work there and that so many of you are still an important part of our lives. And I am already praising God for the impact that he will continue to make through your love and faithfulness in Georgetown, Scott County, and beyond. Good morning once again. And so good to hear from so many familiar, friendly voices today. It seems that there was a fitness center that was offering a $1,000 prize to anyone who could demonstrate that they were stronger than the, the gym's owner or their manager. The muscle man, who was the manager of the gym, his test was simply this. He would squeeze a lemon as hard and as tight as he could, and he would squeeze all of the juice out of that lemon into a glass. And then he would hand that lemon off to the, the challenger. And whoever could get one more drop to come out of that lemon would get the $1,000. And as you can imagine, everybody tried. Everybody tried. Weightlifters, construction workers, many people tried to meet this challenge to get that $1,000 prize. But none of them could wring out a single drop. But one day, a very slight-built man, who no one would have ever guessed had ever seen even the inside of a gym, walked in and accepted the manager's challenge. After the laughter kind of died down, as this man signing his name, you know, up for this challenge, the manager, just as he had done every other time, comes out, and he got the lemon, and he got the glass, and he squeezed that fruit as hard as he could, draining so much juice out of it. Eventually, then, he hands this sort of shriveled and wrinkled piece of fruit off to this slender man. And the crowd watched in stunned silence as the little, the little guy clenched his fist around that lemon. And as he squeezed, three drops of lemon juice poured out of the bottom of it. The crowd cheered. And the manager, being an honest man, he went over and got the check and got, the, got that to the man. And while he was doing so, though, he was just, you know, he was beside him. He couldn't understand how in the world did this guy do this? So he asked him, he said, what do you do for a living? And the guy said, are, is he like, are you a lumberjack or are you like a, a weightlifter, what, a wrestler? What do you do? The guy said, no, I work for the IRS. <laughs> They'll be sure to get it. <laughs> They'll be sure. Today we continue. We've been in the series of, of we've been looking at people in the Bible who had an all-in moment with, with Jesus, an all-in moment with God. People who chose to take a huge step of faith as we've chosen to do as a congregation and walk out in great faith following the will of God. 
And today we come to a very interesting story, and you might even think maybe this is a unique story for us to be talking about on a special day like today. This is our, day, our last worship service in this space, and maybe you would have thought as you came in today, you wouldn't have thought to hear about this story we're going to be talking about, but there is a tie-in to today we're going to get to here in a minute and a little bit later on. But we're going to be focusing today on another very slight-built IRS man who collected taxes for Rome from his own politically and militarily oppressed people, the Jews. This man's name was Zacchaeus. And all of a sudden, a lot of you, there's a song going in the back of your head. <laughs> Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. And we're going to read about his encounter with Jesus in Luke chapter 19 today. So if you would go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, verse 1. We're going to have it on the screen as well. So if you can follow along there on your device. And here's what it says. He, and this is Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, the people around him, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. At the end of Luke chapter 18, the chapter that precedes this, Jesus has just done another one of his great miracles. He's restored the sight to a blind beggar who became his follower. And now he moves from the bottom of the social and economic ladder to the top. Because Zacchaeus was a very wealthy person as a tax collector. And we'll talk about the reason why here just momentarily. But he was wealthy. He was wealthy, and his wealth was acquired through a very flawed system that would make a dishonest person out of almost any one of us. As a matter of fact, I mean, when you hear about this, consider for yourself how well you perhaps could have navigated with the allowances that were allowed for the tax collectors in that day, because here was what the situation was. His job as a tax collector was to collect taxes for the Roman Empire and what they required. And then they gave him space to essentially pad that number with whatever he wanted for his own pocket. So there was the bottom line, the baseline tax that was expected from the Roman government, and then the tax collector could add to that whatever number he wanted for his own pocket, and that was what you had to pay the tax collector. And everybody knew that system. Everybody knew it was a corrupt system. They knew what was going on, yet really had no choice but to, to go along with it. He enriched himself by taking advantage of his own people. It made him prosper but it didn't make him popular. I think about that, that passage of Scripture, I think it was where Paul said, you know, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And not even what he was doing here is permissible, but you get the idea. Even if someone said yes, it wasn't a good thing. Even if the government said he could do it, it wasn't the right thing. He was eminently wealthy, but exceptionally resented. Any self-respecting Jewish rabbi in those days would have harbored a very deep-seated contempt or just an outright hatred for tax collectors like Zacchaeus. But there was one young rabbi who loved this tax collector. And he redirected that tax collector's life. He realigned his value system and he redeemed his soul. And Zacchaeus today serves as a model disciple for us. He really serves in his example of how he followed Jesus. Is really an, he serves as an example of what we're challenging everyone. And we're challenging all of ourselves as Northside Christian Church. What we want to be in following Jesus in the words of Ken Eidelman, here's what we are to do. And here's what Zacchaeus did. He followed Jesus. He was changed by Jesus. And then he was on mission with Jesus. 
We're challenged to follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and then be on mission with Jesus. Let's talk about following Jesus just for a minute here. Verses 3 and 4 state that Zacchaeus was seeking who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. And so he ran ahead and he climbed in that sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. That's what we read a minute ago. So old Zach, we'll call him, went to some trouble to go and see Jesus He was short in stature, but he also knew this. He was presented with a problem because here's this crowd of people crowding around Jesus, and he's not the most popular guy to the people in that crowd. Do you think they're going to make way for him? Yeah, yeah, whatever, shorty. You stay back here. So as opposed to trying to even chance interactions with these people, he knows don't like him. He looks and says, you know what, there's a tree I'm going to climb that tree. No one would have excused him to get a better place to stand. So he he runs up that tree and he climbs there and he he waits for Jesus to pass by. And there's something drawing him to Jesus. He had, by what the world would say, he had everything. Yet he felt at the same time he had nothing. There's something drawing him. But something about this Jesus that he's got to figure out. He wants to know who this Jesus is and what he was of all about. Chuck Swindoll said it this way, Zacchaeus knew something was missing, and most folks do. They try to drown it in a bottle of alcohol, lose it in a fog of drugs, crowd it out in work and activity, or bury it in the shallow grave of bravado and tough talk. But when it gets quiet, and no one is around but you and God, reality sounds as loud in your soul as the blast of a thousand trumpets, and you know you need something that you don't have. He didn't just want to see Jesus. He wanted to see who Jesus was. That's what the passage said. He wanted to figure out what is it that makes Jesus different from everyone else. He's like, I just heard about this guy that got healed, this blind man whose sight was restored on the outskirts of Jericho. I want to know what is it about this Jesus? He may not have fully even understood what was going on in his own heart, but there was something drawing him to the Savior. And although it would have been very undignified for a wealthy man such as he to climb up in a tree like he did, he wasn't going to let that stop him. He was uninhibited in that regard. Trees trees don't cast judgment. Crowds cast judgment, but trees don't. And so he climbs up in the tree to see Jesus. Not only was he trying to see Jesus, but he was seeking Jesus. And in this text, we learn a very wonderful truth about the grace and love of Jesus Christ. And that's this, that while we're seeking him, He's also seeking us. He's looking for us. As a matter of fact, 1 John chapter 1, or sorry, chapter 4, verse 19, says that Jesus first loved us and sought us out. And that's what we see in this story as well. We see where it said Jesus came to the place, he looked up to him, and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And so he hurried and he came down and received him joyfully. First of all, it's pretty cool that Jesus addresses Zacchaeus by his name. You know, there's nothing to indicate that these men had ever met before, and we know Jesus is divine, so we understand that he has that, that knowledge, but it's so cool he just says, Zacchaeus, whoa, what a moment. And then he gives him two commands. Come down immediately. Climb out of that tree right now. There's always a sense of urgency about following Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says it this way. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says it in this way. And, and exactly what Paul, Paul references a previous, another passage of Scripture. And then he comes in and gives an explanation. And here's what he references. He says, in a favorable time, I listen to you. In a favorable time, I listen to you. How many times do we say that to God? In a favorable time, I'll listen to you, God. I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you. And then here's the commentary that Paul adds to it. Behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. And so he gives them, he, he, this is a command, climb, climb down immediately. And then he gives them a second command. He says, I must stay at your house today. This is one, the only time in all four Gospels that Jesus invites himself over to somebody's house. <laughs> it's the only time that he does that. And he does it with a purpose. And it ties into what what is being said at the end of the passage, the very statement that Jesus said about his mission and his ministry is to seek and to save the lost. And so what he's doing is he's reinforcing that by this invitation, inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' house. He wants to seek out and save people like us 
like Zacchaeus, people who he knows, people who Jesus wants, people whom he loves. And the evidence that Zacchaeus followed is revealed in those words in Luke 19, excuse me, 19, 6. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. With a great sense of acceptance and with greater joy, he welcomed Jesus into his home and they broke bread together. And when he did, after they were breaking bread together, Zacchaeus pushes himself away from the table and he has this moment and he makes an announcement that reveals that he's not just about following Jesus, but he's about letting Jesus change his heart. And that's what happens. He pushes away, he makes this announcement that announces that he is being changed by Jesus in so many words. Verses 8 and 9 reveal the beginnings of this change, this new path. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Once we decide to follow Jesus and and we welcome him gladly to make our heart his home, we will not be the same. He begins to change us. Immediately what we see is our values begin to change. So, you know, we might be pursuing money like Zacchaeus and and wealth and and all of these things. Maybe we might be pursuing that or something else has got our attention. But when Jesus comes in, he says very clearly that, you know, it's all about him. And that our lives now become all about being Christ-like and and trying to live in a way that honors God. And so that becomes the great value. Now, of course, you all know that the follow-up to this is we understand that's our value, but then there's the behaviors that have to align with that value and while the value itself may have changed, the behaviors take time. And with time, there's this now beginning this slow process of, of integrating our behaviors with the, now what we value in God. And that's a process that demands grace. But here's the point. No one who becomes a disciple of Jesus Christ remains unchanged. Zacchaeus' words indicate that at that very moment, he was ready to commit. He was ready to make changes in his life, and he still didn't know so many of the things that were going to have to change, but that's where he was, and he was taking that first step. And he voluntarily makes what comes through his mind, what's led to him by the Spirit and things. He says, you know what, I'm going to voluntarily make this commitment that I need to make restitution, and I need to be generous. And so he begins to change, and it shows that he is sold out internally. This is his all-in moment. This is his all-in moment. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, wrote in one of his documented prayers, he said this, Lord, I give you everything there is in this man, William Booth. Do with me what you will. And I believe God loves an authentic prayer like this, which when we invite his spirit into our lives, no holds barred, come in and just change us from the inside out. So here's what Zach decides to do. He says he, he renounced his love of money and he released his love for God. He demonstrated a major shift in his value system. He made two voluntary commitments. No one cajoled him. Jesus didn't suggest or plant this idea. He just, from all we can tell here, he just pro- is prompted to do it by the Spirit. He makes two voluntary commitments that show this huge change happening in him. And the first is to show generosity to the poor. What a big shift this is, the generosity He's been taking advantage of them for years. And now, now he says, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give, he says, up to half my goods to the poor. Now, we sometimes think we're generous if we give God 10%. Or the Old Testament standard was actually 20% was as, as the Old Testament time standard of generosity. But Zacchaeus was giving away 50%. And the point here is not about what is being given but the change that it reflects. The money's not something to be held onto anymore. It's not possessing him. He sees that it comes from God and it's to be used for his glory. And that's all it's about. Whatever we have, whatever we use, that we see ourselves as being used or or here to be uh, used and allow ourselves to be used for God's glory. The evidence of his life transformation was moving from consuming for himself to giving of himself. His stunning generosity Before he met Jesus, his money was everything to him. And now it wasn't something to live for. It was something to be given and used to honor God and bless people in his name. Albert Schweitzer said something that maybe even some of us are maybe wrestling a little bit with today as we mark this momentous occasion for our church. He said this, if you own something that you cannot give away, then you don't own it. It owns you. But there's a second layer to Zach's commitment. It's not only generosity, it's restitution. 
He says, if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Now that's over the top. The Old Testament truly just required at a very minimum one-fifth of what was defrauded. So let's say you defrauded somebody out of $100. If you were trying to make restitution to them, you would have to pay it back in, in terms of $120. That would be what would be considered literal money restitution. That's what would be expected, the minimum. But Zacchaeus is saying he would pay back four times the amount. In essence, if he had defrauded someone from $100, that he would pay that person back $400. Fourfold restitution was the ultimate in Jewish culture for making reparations. He knew his behavior had been dishonest, and he was eager to make things right no matter the cost. He learned that you can have job security, financial security, and social security, but without spiritual security, things just aren't right. Some of you, maybe, maybe we've understood that lesson too. We ask this, I'm going to ask ourselves this question. Ask yourself this question here right in this moment today. For where we are today, where, where you are today, whatever you're dealing with, is it well with my soul? That's the big question of life in so many respects. That's the question. What's our spiritual security at? Contrast Zacchaeus with the rich young ruler. We talked about the rich young ruler a few weeks ago in our sermon series here. Both of them were wealthy. Both came face to face with Jesus. But to the rich young ruler, Jesus was just a good teacher. And so when it got to the point where he asked of him something that was really challenging that is, to, to release those things he held dearest to himself. He walked away sad. He was only a good teacher to the rich young ruler, but to Zacchaeus, Jesus was Lord. And that made a difference. The rich young ruler was commanded by Jesus to be generous with the poor, and he didn't obey. Zacchaeus, though voluntarily committed to give half of his wealth to the poor and to use the other half to dramatically right some wrongs from his past at his own initiation... And don't miss this. Notice what happened. When the rich young ruler walked away from Jesus in that moment, when he rejected what Jesus had asked him to do, he walked away how? He walked away sad. Zacchaeus walked away from this moment with Jesus, and he walked away so full of life and so full of joy. Perhaps because, in part, Jesus said to him Luke, in Luke chapter 19, verse 9, he said, today salvation has come to this house. What great words that must have been to Zacchaeus. His pocketbook may have been lighter, but so was his soul. Nothing in this life compares with the joy of salvation and forgiveness. Mark Batterson writes this, It doesn't matter whether you're a journalist, a teacher, an entrepreneur, an artist, a politician, doctor, a lawyer, or day laborer. What matters is that you are using whatever you have for God's purposes. Don't just make a living, make a life, make a mark, make a difference. You don't need to change jobs. You don't need to change circumstances. You don't need to change friends or change spouses. You just need to let Jesus change you. But then I want to get to the last part today, because this is really where it ties into our moment today as a church. There's a postscript to this story, which is really the purpose of all of it. Zacchaeus followed Jesus. He was changed by Jesus, and then he was on mission with Jesus. He was on mission with Jesus. Verse 10 expresses the mission very plainly. What is the mission? For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus became a disciple, and that's why Jesus came, to make disciples out of us, and that we would make disciples and be used by him to make disciples as well as we serve others around us and love the communities around us. Without strings attached, but with unconditional love. As a visible body of Christ on earth, it's why we're here. I think Zacchaeus probably knew what would happen when he would start going door to door to all those people in Jericho who he had defrauded, and he just shows up and says, hey, here's, here's money, fourfold, by the way. Can you imagine what their reaction might have been? People don't do that kind of thing. He knows what that's going to do. It's going to start people asking questions. Well, why are you doing this? Well, let me tell you about the reason why I'm doing this. Let me tell you about what a guy named Jesus did for me. And he would have this story to tell them about his life-changing encounter and his personal relationship with the Son of God. And with every front door and every heart's door would be open to hear his testimony. 
He had a new life purpose. No longer was his only purpose to make money and invest money and spend money and hoard money. His change in values and behavior was opening up a new world of relationships and a new life of fulfillment. He was on mission with Jesus now. He was all in for his neighbors. He was all in for loving them and caring about them. He was all in for his city. He was all in for the world and trying to tell the world about who Jesus Christ was and making sure in love that they had the same access to the great gospel that brought him such peace in his life. And in the process, he realized that when you're all in for the mission of God, in many ways you then in the end become the primary beneficiary. Let me ask us this today. Who's our 8 to 15? Who's our 8 to 15? Who are our 8 to 15? That's the challenge one church I read about this week shared with its members. The church I'm talking about is a ministry that is a ministry partner with actually our missionaries, our church planning missionaries in Texas, Joe and Patty Klein. And there's a handout they share with their members. I'm going to show it on the screen here. This is the handout. It talks about who are my 8 to 15 And you may not be able to read that, especially if you're here in-house, but I'll explain a little bit of it to you here in a minute. It's based on the assertion that's found in step one of this document here. There's a step one there, and here's what step one says. It says this, that God strategically and supernaturally placed people in your life to point them to the hope and rescue of Jesus. Have you ever thought about the reason God has people in your life? Why you cross paths with certain people? Why they're a part of you? and part of what you do day to day. So what they do is they encourage members of the church to consider who are their 8 to 15 people that fit that, that category. They want to encourage them to pray for them, to invest in them, to invite them, and, and also to prayerfully prepare themselves to share their story of what Jesus has done with those people. Who are the people to consider for that list if we were like making a list of our own? What about pre-Christians? Who are the pre-Christians in your life? People who have not yet let place their faith in Christ? Who are the prodigals? Who are the believers who are not actively pursuing their faith? They believe in Jesus, but they're just not engaged. Who are the purposefuls? The believers who are pursuing their faith, but God has you right there to encourage them along that journey. Or how about the potentials? Those who seem to be showing up on life's front burner more often than in the past. And you know what? They're like, they just, you keep crossing our paths. Why are we keep crossing our paths? Well, maybe that is, there's a divine appointment that God has brought about there. His mission was to seek and save the lost. And so often we're content to look at our lives and to justify and say, I've got fruit. Look at my fruit. My fruit is I attend this activity at church. I go to Bible studies. I go to worship. And yeah, that, that's important. That's, that's fruit as well. But look at what our Savior is doing in this passage today. Is it possible to say that we are producing healthy fruit in our lives unless we are actively and intentionally seeking the lost who need hope around us in order to bring them to Jesus. Zacchaeus climbed a tree to get to Jesus, and in a sense, so have we. As we've been reminded today by reflections of Northside's past, we're reminded that we have been the beneficiaries of a tree planted years ago. You know, someone planted that sycamore tree. Somehow that tree got there, and he climbed up on it. He was the beneficiary of that. And we've climbed up a tree as well, the beneficiaries of people who planted this church 62 years ago. And we've personally reaped the fruit of so much that has been invested over that time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, Paul writes this. He says, for we are God's fellow workers. You, he's talking to the church, are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which has been laid, which is Christ Jesus. But just like Zacchaeus, Jesus isn't content to simply let us sit up there in the tree. It's great to have the tree when we need it. It's great that we are the beneficiaries of what God has done over 62 years, but Jesus isn't content to let us just sit in the tree. He invites us to come and to actively, generously, and wholly with all of ourselves join him in his mission that other people may find the same refuge and transformation in him that we would be actively engaged down on the ground, planting the trees that will also grow, the seeds that will also grow into trees that will help people to experience the transformation of Jesus Christ. 
I think it's great fall is actually tree planting season. We're getting ready to actually to plant a bunch of trees out even on the hillside property as we move in here. And hopefully that'll happen this week as we, as we prepare to get into the building. This is tree planting season. And as we're entering tree planting season, I want us to ask this question, where are we planting the trees around us in our lives upon which others will see Jesus and experience his fruit? Not just as a church, but as believers who are endeavoring to follow Jesus, to be changed by him and be on mission with him. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for this great, for many of us, familiar story of Zacchaeus. Lord, what a powerful scene. Here's a man full of shame, afraid really to even try to break through the crowd because he is so on an island. Instead, you break through the crowd and you come over to the tree and you say, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. Come down. Stop being up in that tree. Come down and live with me. Live in me. Let me show you a new life full of joy. That's the mission of the church, Lord, to seek and to save the lost. We thank you for 62 years of people pursuing that mission and us being the beneficiaries of so much invested over that time. But Father, may we also be found faithful as we move forward into the future. May we begin and be receptive to the call and the conviction that we are to be planting those trees. We are to be planting those seeds. We are to be helping other people have that same experience. And so, Father, I pray that you would guide us as we go from this point. But, Lord, maybe today there's a seed that's been planted. We're going to have a time of invitation here in just a minute. And, Father, maybe there's a seed that's been planted today just in this experience that we share in together. And we pray, Father, that if that's the case and someone needs to come forward and give their life to Christ, we would encourage them to do so today. Father, guide us, direct us in all that we do. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, if you're with us here in this place, we encourage you to make that decision as we sing this song of invitation. If you're watching with us online today, we encourage you just to reach out to us through the Facebook page or at office at nschristianchurch.org, and we're glad to come alongside you and help you take that step of faith as well and encourage you in that. But today we want to worship right now in this moment. Let's worship our God, uh, the God who is so great and who loves us so much. Let's stand together and sing.
seat. I want to share with you another letter. This letter is from Dwight and Becky Elam. To our dear friends at Northside, in March 1998, three events happened that I look back on with enjoyment and fond memories. Number one, Georgetown College won the NAIA National Basketball Tournament. Number two, the University of Kentucky won the NCAA Basketball Tournament. And number three, Becky and I began our ministry at Northside Christian. Growing up in the Lexington area, also living in Grayson and Versailles, we felt we were coming home after being in Florida for three years. We soon became an active part of our new home. Our church family welcomed us with open arms. The church building was beautiful, and Georgetown was a friendly place to live. We quickly felt at home. I remember after eating at Sam's Truck Stop that Becky and I said, this will be one of our favorite places and it was. Eventually the membership grew and it became obvious that being landlocked was going to become a hindrance to additional growth. We had to have people walk to service from a distance down the hill to allow visitors parking places closer to the building. Barbara Moore as a realtor knew about property on the bypass that was available to buy. I went out with her and walked the property. It had a beautiful layout that would allow for multiple uses that we didn't have with the downtown property. So after much prayer and monetary giving, the property was purchased and quickly paid off. A road was built and a shelter raised, and we then had a place to have picnics and outdoor activities. During our ministry from 1998 to 2005, strong friends were made, many joined, many baptisms, weddings, births, funerals, graduations, picnics, 
fellowship. I often talk about my quote unquote surprise 50th birthday party, followed by the events that took place on 9 11, the moving service that we had the following Sunday with Kate Smith's, Kate Smith's God Bless America and Lee Greenwood's I'm Proud to Be an American. It's my prayer that Northside will continue to follow the path established by Bible believing, love, and comfort giving, hardworking men and women for the kingdom, many of which were your parents and grandparents. I'm proud to have served at Northside for the time we were there. We cherish the good memories of our time there and the friends we made that we talk of often. We love hearing from you when you all come to Florida, and we look forward to those reunions. May God richly bless this move to the Hillside property in his service, Dwight and Becky Elam. So thankful so much to all of those ministers who uh, submitted videos and letters and things to participate with us in this, this time to celebrate with us. Uh, we so appreciate their involvement with this, uh, this special day in our history. At this time, I'm going to uh, ask our elders to come forward, uh, Del Elliott and David Llewellyn. And I'm also going to ask, we have a number of people here uh, who are from uh, the new owners of this space, Marshall Pediatric Therapy. And I'm going to ask if you all would come forward. Uh, i got Jim and Pam Marshall, the owners of Marshall Pediatric, are here. And if you all would come forward, we'd just like to have a, a moment of just prayer, prayerful blessing over your all's work. I want to tell you, and you all can just come up here to the front, in front of the pews here. Um, I want to tell you, I don't think we could have asked for a better partner <laughs> in this whole transition. Uh, I don't think we could have asked for better neighbors, honestly. We've had a really good uh, time over the last year, I think, getting to know each other, and hopefully that's felt on the other end as well. <laughs> so we are very, very appreciative of Marshall Pediatric Therapy. We appreciate you all helping us in this transition, and we are excited for you all to be in Georgetown and the work that you do. We see the kids outside. I don't know if you've been here through the week, y'all, but th there's kids, families coming in this, out of this building all the time and they're just doing a wonderful, wonderful work. And so we're very thankful and grateful uh, for your work and your presence here in Georgetown. And we just want to take some time. Our elders want to say a prayer of blessing over your work as you take ownership of this space. That God will continue to exercise his love through the work that you do. So let's go ahead and let's bow in prayer. And our guys will lead us at this time. Dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for the many years that Northside has been in this location and the many, many people that have come to know you through its work and the many lives that have been, been saved by dedicating their lives to you. As we prepare to move on to our, to our new building and a place where many more lives will be saved, I ask that you, you will bless the new owners of this building as Marshall Pediatric takes over and, and they, they seek to fulfill a mission of their own, a, a mission that also changes and saves lives. We ask that you, you bless them and guide them through, the, through their work and that they will also have as much success, if not more, than Northside had at this location. It's in your son's precious name that we pray. Father God, as we continue in prayer, Lord, just uh, thank you for another day of life. Thank you for all the many blessings you do give us, Lord. And as, as I just want to reiterate is what Dale said, Lord, we just, as even though the ownership of this building has changed, Lord, uh, we know that you own it all, Lord. It's all yours. So I just pray now that you uh, bless the marshals in this space, in this property, Lord, that you uh, allow it to be a, continue to be a beacon of light and hope in this community, Lord. Uh, just bless the work they do, the new ministry with the families, Lord. Uh, just guide and direct them, Lord, that just... Uh, so they can be a blessing and ultimately uh, help people. Lord, again, we just, uh, I thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being patient and kind to us. And it's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. As we approach the closing of our service here today, of course, we want to remind, we've been talking about generosity today, and it's only fitting that we also remind everybody that we get that opportunity every Sunday in many ways to be generous with time, resources, uh, and one of those, of course, is, is through financial resources, and we want to make sure just to remind everyone of the different opportunities for doing that, offering boxes, the online giving, and, of course, 
uh, the P.O. box. And so uh, we encourage you to give as the Lord lead, leads on your heart. And that's simply all we can ask. And, and that's the, God has always been good to provide for Northside Christian Church in that way. I want to, of course, remind everybody that next week we will be meeting in our new location at 101 Ferguson Lane. 101 Ferguson Lane is where we were going to be worshiping. <laughs> Lord willing, next week. So if you show up here, <laughs> you know, you may have a great worship service on your own, but I, you know, we're going to be over there. So no, we want to encourage you to come out, bring, you know, bring your friends, invite them and things. Of course, the online will continue as well uh, next week, and uh, we will begin to celebrate in a whole new way, Got what God is doing in uh, Northside Christian Church. And so we want to encourage you to be there with us. We're going to go all in next weekend, all right? Also, to help celebrate that moment, uh, we are also going to be having our annual fall festival that afternoon from 4 to 6.30 p.m. Also out at the new property, out at uh, the, the hillside property. We're going to have to like start calling it like Northside Christian Church <laughs> out there. Uh, but uh, out at there at the, the new property, 4 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to have our fall festival, inflatables, and all the things you come to expect. Although we do, we, we won't have you have the, the ponies. We didn't get the ponies. They, they kind of changed their things on us this year. But we got the inflatables. We have the food. We're going to have the hay rides. All of those things, the, the s'mores and everything out there. It's going to be a lot of fun. We encourage you to come out there with us next Sunday afternoon. And at this time, I'm going to invite Derek Forster. He's coming up here. He's going to give us an update. Of course, we've got some last a little bit of things to move this week, and so he's going to give us some information about that, and uh, I think ask for a little bit of help. So go ahead, Derek. Is this, this okay, this is on. Um, yeah, I'm filling in with that for Alan Loser this week. His family's on vacation. He's been coordinating a lot of the moving activities. So I just want to say, um, it, unbelievable the, uh, the turnout for moving this past week. Um, I, I've never seen uh, so many people. We were here Wednesday to help. And even the rain didn't even matter. Like, people just determined to, to help get things moved and an amazing amount of stuff that got moved last week. So we're almost there. We need one more night of moving, we think. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and set that for Wednesday at 6 o'clock. So just like we did this past week, if you can come Wednesday at 6 o'clock, plan for 6 to 8 p.m. If you have a truck and trailer and can bring those, uh, I think we'll be able to get things um, done then. So we have basically the office stuff downstairs, I think three desks, a file cabinet, some few other things. Uh, so probably nothing like we've been moving. So hopefully we can get that taken care of this Wednesday night. Um, the other thing is it sounds like there, there's a lot of things that need to be um, kind of set up. Uh, and so uh, TVs to be mounted. I think there's some furniture and that type of stuff that needs to be assembled. Um, if you guys have some skill in that, guys or girls have some skill in that, in particular, you're skilled with a level. <laughs> we want to make sure these things are level uh, for aesthetic purposes. Um, so if you're that person who always makes it, you know, slightly off, maybe, you know, sit this one out. But if you have skill, <laughs> but if you have skill with a level and some power tools and stuff, um, we could use you this week to get some of these things taken care of. Uh, I think it's kind of, uh, basically open to whatever your schedule allows. So you can certainly contact me, I guess, Nick and Wayne. It's okay if they contact you guys directly uh, for whatever your schedule allows. You guys have said Nick and Wayne, and I think we'll, um, we'll make whatever needs to be done to get you access to the building for whatever time you have available. If it's Monday at a random hour or throughout the week, um, feel free to reach out to them. We'll try to get these things taken care of this week. But definitely the scheduled part of that is Wednesday at 6 p.m. here at the church building. We'll meet uh, and get the rest of the stuff taken care of. And I think that's all I got, unless I missed anything that you guys missed. All right. Let's stand together as we close with prayer today. Father, we are super excited for what you are doing in this place with these people. And Father, we pray that we can follow your will. Just as Zacchaeus was changed, may we continue to change in our lives and become more and more like Jesus Christ. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for all things. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. One, two. Oh
fire.